Hello everyone, welcome to my messy studio. My name is Mark and I'm an artist and an art professor. In this video, we're going to be taking a very close look at the pen and ink drawings of one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, the German painter, sculptor, and engraver Käthe Kollwitz. I'm going to briefly talk about her work and then I'm going to copy this brilliant pen and ink self-portrait done when she was about 23 years old to see what strategies were used to make it. Then I'm going to attempt to apply what I've learned through the copy to do a drawing of my own. Let's get started. Katja Kolwitz was born in Konigsberg, Prussia in 1867 to working class parents and began her formal artistic training as a teenager at the School for Women Artists in Berlin. While studying in Munich, she met her husband Karl, a medical student, and they married and moved to Berlin where he tended to the poor. Her working class roots and the exposure to suffering through her husband's medical practice inspired her to create stark, impassioned imagery depicting misery and oppression. In a personal journal, she wrote, It is my duty to voice the sufferings of mankind, the never-ending sufferings heaped mountain high. This is my task, but it is not an easy one to fulfill. Though she was a powerful sculptor and painter as well, Kollwitz is probably best remembered as a printmaker, with some of her best-known works being a series of six prints called The Weaver's Rebellion and another series of seven prints called The Peasant's War. The Weavers, completed between 1893 and 1897, comprised of three lithographs and three etchings and represented a doomed revolt by a union of weavers in Silesia in the middle of the 19th century. These works received wide acclaim and were nominated for a gold medal in the Great Berlin Art Exhibition of 1898, an award ultimately denied to Kollwitz because she was a woman. The Peasants' War was probably Kollwitz's highest achievement. Completed between 1902 and 1908, it depicted a mass uprising of peasants against their feudal landlords in the 16th century. This series of seven prints stand, along with Goya's The Horrors of War, as some of the most powerful, mournful, and compassionate depictions of violence and its aftermath to ever be put down on paper. Kollwitz's work is not easy viewing, reflecting a life filled with anxiety, grief, and depression, the loss of her younger brother as a child, the death of her son in World War I, the rise of Nazism, and the horrors of World War II. And yet, despite the relentless depictions of cruelty and suffering, of death and destruction, her work is so filled with powerful graphic vision that it roars in protest rather than whimpers in anguish. Since the purpose of this video is to look at Kollwitz's pen and ink drawing technique, I'm not going to discuss her life and times and her artistic output in detail. If you're unfamiliar with this artist or simply want to learn more, I encourage you to explore some of the resources I will link to at the end of the video and leave in the description. The drawing we're going to be copying was done in 1890 and belongs to a series of self-portraits that were done in the very early part of her career. These stunning drawings, though suffused with somber chiaroscuro that is characteristic of much of her output in her later career, still manages to convey the artist's youthful and perhaps even still hopeful outlook. Stylistically and often compositionally, these drawings were influenced by the etchings of Rembrandt in their use of dramatic light and dark. The hatching method differed from the great Dutch master, however, in that Rembrandt's mark making was relatively short, rounded, and form describing, whereas Kollwitz's hatching style was long, relatively straight, a way of working that was prevalent at the time of her training. This type of hatching can also be seen in the graphic works of Anders Zorn, who was her contemporary but worked in an older tradition. And this style of rendering also influenced artists well into the 20th century, artists such as Edward Hopper. So, how do we define this way of working? Since a universal nomenclature doesn't exist for hatching methods, I'm going to call this one the hybrid style. If you've seen my previous videos on various hatching techniques, I describe three broad categories of hatching. Parallel hatching, where strokes are put down in a single direction. Cross hatching, where strokes are put down at different angles. And cross contour hatching, where strokes are put down in the direction of the curves and planes being represented. While many of the drawings of the masters fall strictly into one of these three categories, in this case, Kollwitz is using all three. We have parallel hatching, with lines put down in a single direction, visible throughout the drawing, but most prominent in the near cheek. Then we have cross hatching, where hatching is put down at somewhat arbitrary angles that are visible in the near eye, the cheekbone, and the bottom of the nose. 
And finally, we have cross contour hatching with lines put down at different angles to contour the forms used to define the facial features such as the lips, the nose, and the eyes. We'll discuss the three hatching types in more detail as I do the copy, but before we do that, we need to decide what materials to use. Since this drawing was done using pen and ink, we should probably choose a pen to work with. Kolwitz most likely used a dip pen with a semi-flexed nib that was capable of going from an extra fine to a medium line. Since my plan is to use a fountain pen, I'm going to choose one that has similar semi-flexible properties. So for this drawing, I'm going to use a very special pen in honor of Kolwitz's German heritage, this vintage Mont Blanc 344G with a wonderfully responsive extra fine semi-flex nib, a pen that I went through pretty ridiculous lengths to obtain. And though the use of a pen like this might seem like it goes against Kolwitz's socialist leanings, keep in mind that Mont Blanc wasn't always the bloated luxury brand that it is today, but one that produced quality pens for a variety of price ranges, including this pen which was intended for teachers and low-level bureaucrats. As for ink, since this drawing also uses wash, we're going to need something waterproof, so I'm going with Noodler's Black. Platinum Carbon Black would also work, but I prefer not to use it in my vintage pens, or really any pen that can't be fully disassembled and cleaned. It looks like in the initial line work, Kowitz diluted her ink so it was dark gray, so I'm going to do the same using a dilution of Noodler's Black that's about one part ink and two parts water. As for paper, again, since we're using wash, we're going to need something that takes both pen and aqueous media. Judging from the rough edges of some of the washes, I suspect that Kolwitz was using a paper that had some texture to it. All the multimedia papers in my collection felt too smooth for this drawing, so instead I chose this inexpensive hot press watercolor paper, an unknown brand which I bought at a discount years ago, which, while smooth enough to be used for pen and ink, also has just enough texture that it allows for the creation of some of the scrapey looking textures in the drawing. By the way, I don't know how to explain the strange speckled textures of the washes at the bottom. It feels like the paper there resisted the wash, allowing white spots to show through, perhaps a result of an uneven way the paper was sized. If anyone out there, a paper conservator, might know what caused this, an explanation would be very much appreciated. Okay, now that we've decided on materials, let's begin our copy. I cut the paper down to the original format of the drawing, 233 by 166 millimeters, or for my American audience, roughly nine by six and a half inches. I sketch things in using a graphite pencil and I'm now ready to start inking. While it's impossible to ascertain the order in which the strokes were put down in a drawing, I believe Kowitz started her drawing with parallel hatching to establish the overall light and dark pattern on the face. These strokes were fairly light and straight and for the most part disregarding the turning of the forms with the exception of the forehead where the strokes are broken into several angles to represent the shifting planes of the forehead and the temple. In the next few layers the hatching shifts angles slightly but still falls into the parallel hatching category since the strokes are still more or less going the same direction. This layer, which we'll call messy parallel hatching, is used to strengthen shadow shapes and to add contrast to the drawing. The next stage in the drawing, in my opinion, would be some cross contour hatching to define the facial features, the eyes, the nose, and the lips. Here the strokes are shorter and multi-directional, curving out the subtly shifting forms. This would be a great time to focus on the very many subtle things that Kowitz is doing to produce a successful drawing. First, notice how few sharp lines there are inside the forms making up the facial features. The edge of the nose on the lighter side is defined not with a sharp line, but with a series of very short hatch marks which create the impression of curving form. A sharp line there would have made the nose appear flat and cut out. Also, notice the similar lack of sharp outlines around the lips, again creating a strong impression of turning volume. Kowitz understood that to create a sense of turning form, sharp lines should be avoided. And while there are a few sharp lines here and there, such as in the upper eyelid on the nearest eye, they're mostly used as accents. Notice that the nearer corner of the mouth is rendered with slightly stronger marks than the farther corner. The near eye has slightly stronger hatching than the farther eye, and that some of the strongest hatching is on the part of the face closest to the viewer, the nose. 
This use of texture to reinforce depth is something often seen in portraiture and applies not just to drawing, not just to pen and ink, but also to painting. For example, Rembrandt would always place the strongest texture on the nose with decreasing textures on things that were farther away. While Kowitz is doing many things that I have recommended doing in my previous videos, I should also point out that she does three things in her hatching that I warn against. First, she's using straight hatching on round forms. This is okay when doing thin, finely spaced parallel hatching, but there are areas where the hatching here is not so finely spaced, which can create a flattening effect. These straight hatch marks are still effective, however, because she's using them in combination with wash, which diminishes their strength. The second thing that Kowitz does, which I advise against, is that often her hatch marks are not consistently spaced, at times being quite wide apart, as in the forehead and the nearest cheekbone, and sometimes quite closely fused together, such as the area above the lips. This inconsistency in gauge breaks the illusion of value and creates the impression of texture. While I do think that maintaining a consistent gauge is important in order to get a realistic effect, in this case, Kowitz is able to get away with it, again, because part of the drawing is done with washes, which do a fantastic job controlling the values, and because the overall value structure in the drawing is superb. The last thing that I advise against is not shifting the angle of the hatch enough when putting down layers, which creates a messy, splotchy effect. Here, however, it wasn't Kowitz's intention to be classical and neat, and the messy, inconsistent hatching actually adds to the bristly, intense energy of the drawing. In all three cases, the straight hatching, the inconsistent gauge, and the insufficient shift in angles are remedied by the softening effect of washes, but really, this is a perfect example of how flexible the so-called rules of art making really are. Students are always looking for absolute rules to follow, and are often frustrated when told that there are no absolutes. The fact is, the rules of art are not really rules at all, but rather strategies that increase the chance that your work of art will be successful, and as such are often broken by master artists. The key is to understand the rules, and to understand what effect is created when they are not implemented. In the case of Kollwitz's drawing, the broken rules create the effect of roughness of nervous energy, which combined with the stark backlighting, the focused, determined facial expression, create a work of art suffused with mystery and intense introspection. At this stage, I believe that Kolwitz went in with a light wash to reinforce the contrast and to add subtlety to some of the delicate transitions from shadow to light. While this wash could have been done more toward the end of the drawing, my guess is that doing so would have made modeling the face more difficult, since the white of the paper would have interfered with the ability to judge values. Note the washes are mixed very carefully in contrast to the looseness of the hatching and are used to make subtle indications of form and to put in some delicate reflections on the shadow side, on the tip of the nose, and the bottom of the nostril. It's interesting, in many drawings, the penwork is tight and accurate and is contrasted with very loose washes. In this drawing, it's the other way around. The ink work is loose and expressive, but the washes are careful. This is a fantastic technique that I plan to explore further. Once the wash is dry, I switch back to pen, this time filled with undiluted black ink, and reinforce some of the hatching, mostly using cross hatching, going the opposite direction of the parallel hatch I put down at the beginning. Besides defining the forms and strengthening the contrast, this is the layer where Kolwitz starts to use texture to emphasize depth, adding stronger hatching to areas that are closer to the viewer. This is also the layer where the drawing starts taking on energy, because hatching in opposite directions creates the impression of opposing forces. This is something that I need to talk about in the future, that stroke length and direction, and the angles at which hatch marks intersect, influence the psychology in a drawing, independent of the primary function, which is to render. I'm switching back to wash and getting those strong darks on the side of the face and the dark washes in the hair and shoulders. To get the rough edges of the wash, I'm drying off my brush and scraping against the paper. These kinds of scratchy, splashy, running effects are very hard to reproduce, of course, depending on the chaotic nature of the interaction between the brush, the ink, and the paper. Strangely enough, I actually got some of those mysterious splotches visible in Kolwitz's drawing at the very bottom of the dark washes. Mine, however, occurred in the top left corner of the drawing. 
I'm going to venture a guess and say this is a product of working on old paper where the sizing has started to break down. Again, those of you with a better idea what this could be, please weigh in. Here is my copy. This was not an easy process and mistakes were made. For one thing, I didn't quite get the angle of her nose or the way her lips protrude, nor did I fully capture her somber and intense expression. But keep in mind that I'm not doing an exact replica, but rather trying to understand her process of drawing and her hatching technique. Though my final result was less than perfect, making this copy helped me to better appreciate Kowitz's consummate draftsmanship and the principles behind what makes this portrait of the artist as a young woman so powerful and timeless. The ultimate test to see if I understood anything at all about the way Kowitz drew is to try to do my own drawing, applying the principles I have gleaned from doing the copy. This I believe is a very important second step in the copying process. In my first year as an art student, I took an incredibly valuable class where I copied a painting by Delacroix directly from a museum. The process took almost the entire semester, and one of the professors was a brilliant art conservator who helped me determine what materials and methods to use. No easy task when it comes to reproducing a 19th century oil painting. While copying that painting stroke for stroke was an incredible learning experience, the most valuable assignment came at the end, when we were asked to create our own artwork inspired by what we had just copied. That assignment forced me to think deeply about Delacroix's aesthetic sensibilities, his thought process, and his technical methods, and see how I could incorporate them into my own work. I can think of no better way of incorporating the lessons learned from copying than doing that assignment, which ended up being a self-portrait in the style of Delacroix. Speaking of self-portraits, let's return to the task at hand and do my own, this time in the drawing style of a young Kate Kolwitz. I'm going for a similarly closely cropped composition with dramatic backlighting. Here's a breakdown of the process I'm going to use. I'm going to start with parallel hatching with a dilution of Noodler's Black, again, one part ink, three parts water, followed by some cross contour hatching, this time with undiluted black ink to define the facial features. After this, I put down a light gray wash, and then I use cross hatching to reinforce some of the shadows before finally applying my darker washes. As you watch me work, let's talk about what I've learned from doing the copy. Principle one is that starting with a dark gray rather than black makes it easier to control the values in your drawing. This is something I noticed that Kolwitz does quite a bit in her early pen and ink work, but I hadn't noticed it until I made the copy. The fact that her initial line work was not pure black made the initial very strong parallel hatching look less busy, allowing her to create more subtle value transitions in the shadows. Principle two is that when you have a large area of shadow and a drawing that needs strong dramatic contrast, a great way to start is to fill in the entire area of shadow with a layer of parallel hatching. Even if ultimately you plan to either cross hatch or cross contour hatch your drawing. This layer of parallel hatching is very effective at establishing initial layers of value and provided it's not too busy, will organically blend into your subsequent hatching layers regardless of the method that you use. Principle three is that imprecise hatching can be compensated for with very precise value control with wash. Kolwitz received excellent formal drawing instruction from the age of 12 and was capable of tremendous precision, proven through countless examples of her academic drawing. But in this piece, her hatching is deliberately loose and inconsistent. Despite the brawn and bluster of the hatching, the drawing still manages to feel incredibly solid, again, because the washes are very carefully controlled. Principle four is that though the hatching is imprecise and messy in terms of gauge and consistency, it still manages to be very precise in other ways, which contribute to the solid structure of the drawing. Kowitz carefully makes the hatching stronger on forms that are closer to the viewer, such as the nose and the side of the face. In fact, the strong intersection of hatching on the cheek does a terrific job of emphasizing the closeness of the forms there. Also, the near eye is more strongly rendered than the far eye, the near corner of the mouth more strongly rendered than the far corner. There's a lot of calculated nonchalance in this drawing that is revealed only on closer inspection. And the way copying allows you to see such incredibly subtle things is what makes it such a useful exercise. Principle five is how carefully Kolwitz avoids outlining forms, a mistake 
very common in drawing with a linear medium such as pen and ink. Note that the far edge of the nose and the far edge of the face are not outlined at all, but are defined either through soft washes or short stipple-like hatching. Sharp lines are very limited, and really, the only place where a sharp line is placed on a facial feature is on the upper lid of the near eye. And finally, the last principle, the sixth, is to recognize that a large part of what makes this drawing great is not just the understanding of facial structures and the excellent rendering of facial features, but the fact that even at age 23, Kovitz was already a supreme master of design. The bold, dark washes at the shoulders and the closely cropped format create strong angular shapes, making this drawing an excellent example of the way Kovitz used abstraction to organize her compositions. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the pen and ink drawing methods of Kate Kolwitz. While much of her work has been recognized, standing among the greatest achievements of 20th century art, her early pen and ink drawings deserve to be better known. And those learning to draw with this challenging, often frustrating medium, and even those such as myself who have been drawing with pen and ink for quite some time, have much to learn from them. Thank you very much for watching, and please let me know what artists you'd like me to copy and learn from in the future. Or feel free to suggest other topics for future videos. Your comments are always welcome. Bye for now.